Thanks for joining us here at The Research Her, the show working to improve the health disparities for women of color, one topic at a time. And I am Alicia. I'm here learning and growing with you as we research our way to wellness. Welcome to the last day of being your old self, sis, in the first day of the rest of your life. If you are anything like me, at some point in your life, you were ritualistically using baby powder, baby. I literally would throw it up. Like, I, I would sprinkle it everywhere, and then I would have to go back and clean up and get it off my face and my neck. I would just throw the baby powder everywhere. Never thought about it, just went for it. So I would mainly use it when I knew I was going to be sweating or if I just wanted to smell baby fresh. You know that. You know how that baby, that baby powder smell fresh, okay? One day I'm watching cable television. I know, what what is that? You know, we Netflix it out over here now, but I saw one of those commercials like, if you or any of your loved ones have suffered from ovarian cancer or me- uh, mesothelioma and you've used johnson and johnson's baby powder give this number a call and i'm like "Mm, okay that's weird but of course me being me i did a little quick google search and i was shook there was this report that was from 2018 about what was going on and the new york times reported that there are about 12,000 people seeking damages uh, for ovarian cancer and mesothelioma, (laughs) I cannot, that's so hard to say, that were attributed by the use of Johnson & Johnson's baby powder. A woman in L.A. was actually awarded 400 plus million USD after she had developed ovarian cancer. Wait, what? She So you telling me that sis got ovarian cancer from using baby powder? The, the, that same stuff that I be sprinkling on my baby. Yeah, let's let's talk about that. But before we talk about the research studies, I want to get into this new part of the show where I will be highlighting women of color who are doing dope research out there. One of the big goals for me is to always introduce research topics that we are out here doing and that we don't know about in hopes of maybe sparking something in someone And maybe you pursue the topic or maybe you just want to know more about it. So I'll be having some sisters on the show just highlighting what they're doing. And if you're interested in their work, reach out to them. I'll have their contact information said throughout the show and also in the show notes. So this week we are highlighting our good sis Ashley Milligan who is a microbiologist at a pharmaceutical company in the Philly area. She received her bachelor's of science in biology from Millersville University and in her spare time she focuses on spreading her love for microbiology and all the other sciences through her blog and Instagram. She can be found at Micro Maven on Instagram. And what she really is hoping to do is to inspire um, more women of color to pursue the sciences. Yes, me and my good sis have something in common. Hi, uh, I'm Ashley. I'm a microbiologist at a private pharmaceutical research and development company. They develop a wide variety of drug therapies. Currently, They're primarily focused in the areas of cancer, epilepsy, and Alzheimer's. Pharmaceutical companies, they're driven by the thought of profit as well as helping. These are diseases and disorders that they're absolutely devastating, but I'm sure at least to everyone listening probably knows at least one person suffering from cancer, epilepsy, or Alzheimer's. But uh, right now, Uh, We had clinical trials for Alzheimer's therapy that went really, really well, and currently we're awaiting FDA approval to put the drug on the market. There's no cure, (laughs) so no one could (laughs) get your hopes up yet. For me, my part that I play, I'm a cog in this giant machine of pharma development. Uh, People think that the only routes with a science degree are MD or PhD. And this is absolutely not true. I only have a bachelor's in biology. 
uh, and I was employed immediately, actually before graduation technically. As a microbiologist, my primary responsibilities include performing things like bioburden tests, uh, endotoxin tests, um, microbial identifications to detect harmful microorganisms in the product and our product components. These medications are going into living humans, which means that there are regulations in place for the amount of organisms and especially particular organisms, you know, such as E. coli, that can be present. Without these regulations in place and these standards, would you trust a private company to get rid of these things on their own volition, of their own goodwill to destroy millions of dollars worth of medication? Probably not going to do it. So <laughs> be glad that these regulations exist. Shout out to Molds and Bacteria for keeping me employed. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Ashley, my good sis. Again, if you want to follow her, she is at Micro Maven. It will be in the description. I am having a running cue of our sister in that I'll be highlighting on the show. And if you are doing some good research out there, sis, it don't matter. If you like what you do or even if you don't like what you do, email me at hit us up at theresearchher.com so we can have you highlighted on this show. Now let's get back into the powder, okay? The primary ingredient in most baby powders are going to be sometimes cornstarch and they're also a naturally occurring mineral called talc. The reason we are so attracted to talc is because it can absorb oils, odor, and perspiration. So what that means, we love anytime we ain't sweating and sticky and, and you know, you... I don't got to explain it to you, my good sis. I know you you feel me. So that's why we love talc. It is the softest known mineral on earth. So it is easily broken down. So what these companies are doing is they'll mine it as a rock and then take it back, use some type of cleaning agent, some type of process to get rid of what they believe or believe they're getting rid of all the impurities. Break it down into talc powder. That talc powder is then used as that baby powder. And that's what you see as the baby powder. That's all fine, except the fact that talc and asbestos, they tend to naturally occur in rock form right next to each other. Now, I don't know much about asbestos. All I know is that it's also a natural mineral as well, and it's bad for your health. Very bad for your health. And this is known all throughout literature. So Johnson & Johnson actually has this website about how safe talc is. So you can go check it out. The link to that website will be in the show notes. And on the website, they show all these studies or they cite these studies saying how all the problems with talc is the appearance of asbestos. But that's interesting to me because, okay, you're saying that the talc is safe, but there may be cases where it's asbestos. But then they claim, like, well, our talc is the purest and it has no asbestos. But yet you're paying off people millions of dollars in lawsuits. That's confusing for me. I don't quite get it. You know, I don't get how one could say, oh, we, you know, talc is safe. We don't have asbestos in our, in our talc, but um, I'm going to still pay you money. For this lawsuit okay yeah that's fine but that's just my thinking i could be crazy the research does not know the exact mechanism that results in ovarian cancer and actually it doesn't say whether the baby powder is causing the cancer the reason it's just kind of up in the air right now but we can still talk about the research and take on our own views from this study there are studies that have found talc deep inside of ovarian cancer tumors. So when they're extracting out the tumors, at, when they have a patient, they'll like see what's in it. Like we talked about before in episode seven about antiperspirant and breast cancer, we don't know whether the talc is what caused the cancer or, you know, it's just in there chilling in the tumor cells. So there was one study that was done in 1999, shout out to the 90s, that questioned about 500 women with recent ovarian cancer diagnoses and 500 that weren't diagnosed. 
And what they found was that the women with ovarian cancer were more likely to have used baby powder than those without. Or maybe this is a fluke. You know, you're just questioning people. We don't really know. Maybe there needs to be some more studies done. So there's this study that comes out later, 2013, where over 60,000 women were followed for about 12 years. And essentially what this one found was that talc powder use is not associated with ovarian cancer. And obviously this one is the safe one, right? Because 60,000 women, is this the final answer to the test? Hmm, my personal opinion with some health-related studies is that they rarely break down the demographic of people being studied. In the physical sciences, we do not like to talk about this as much as our sister and brethren over there in um, the social sciences, but different ethnicities respond to conditions differently. In a social science experiment, for instance, researchers are very well, or they understand that there are going to be some external factors that cause black folks to act one way and another group of people to act a different way. But in the physical sciences, we are getting around to really accepting that. And yes, even after years of eugenics, (laughs) I don't even want to get into it. Studies uh, will still say like women are not affected by, but yet you only tested Caucasian women. So are women not affected or just Caucasian women? I think this is the scientific way of saying, oh, we do not see color. We do not see race. (laughs) So in this study, they found that there was no association between baby powder and ovarian cancer. But what was interesting was that not even one-fifth of the women were non-white. And even in the study, it don't even say, like, what type of non-white were they. It's just Caucasians, about 50-some thousand study, were Caucasian. And non-whites, like a few thousand. So they chunked a, just a big group of people. Essentially, this was a study that does not concern people of color because it was a study for white. It was a study full of white women, period. This topic was investigated more and thank god that there was somebody waking up to the black woman health disparities okay the journal cancer epidemiology biomarkers and prevention published a study in 2016 they tested a whopping 1300 black women that made this the largest ovarian cancer case study in african-american women to the day that this was published It was found that, one, our community uses a whole lot of baby powder. Like, about 50 to 60% of black women in this study used it. And then, two, it was found that users who used the baby powder in the genital area had a 40% increased risk of ovarian cancer versus a 30% risk for those who only used it elsewhere so anywhere but the jj the study also found that there is a dose response when using it um on the vagina meaning that if you use more in the vagina there's a higher likeliness of ovarian cancer like i i want to just pause because i can't just skim over this that's a 10 percent increase in likeliness of ovarian cancer so that is very statistically significant okay it should not be that big of a difference. Like, so this 30% risk for non-genital area response was inconsistent with what other studies have found. So some other studies show that as long as people are not putting the powder on their vagina, they'll be fine. Well, they suggested that the reason why they saw this 30% risk It was because, one, the baby powder might have, you know, trickled down into the vaginal area. And that goes back to my point. Like, I wasn't necessarily, and what I said in the beginning, like, I wasn't necessarily putting baby powder on my coochie. I was putting it all over myself. And, you know, it might have got down. I'm moving and shaking. And 
the the powder get down there. And what they also said was a possibility is that African American women have a higher inflammatory response to the powder than white women. So the studies in the past were all centered around studying white women. Alongside of the ovarian cancer findings, this study also found, along with others, that there is an association between using body powder and asthma, which means that there may be some sort of response in the lungs going on due to this baby powder use. I truly appreciate this study um, because it is specific to black women, which is important. Research dedicated to studying black women is essential because we are at a higher risk and doing more studies that focus on just testing us will help us get to the root of understanding why some of these issues are happening. Now, with all these studies... I know I am done with talc powder and I am just one of those people who I'm like, why risk it? We know that there is something funky going on. (laughs) It ain't me though. I ain't funky, but there is something weird going on. So why risk it? Especially knowing black women are dying at higher rates. I hope you took something away from these studies. I want to end this episode on a fun note. I want to introduce another new part of the show where you can submit any interesting topics that you want to inform your sisters about. So it could be anything in any avenue, Millie Rock on any block. We're bringing up anything you think is interesting, but it has to be research supported. And today we will hear from our sis, Jada, who got some goodness for us this week. Hey y'all, so did you know that Europeans who descend from the survivors of the bubonic plague actually cannot contract HIV and AIDS? I may be saying that a little wrong, but they're actually immune to the disease, but that does not mean that they cannot pass it on from partner to partner. It is also interesting that the virus did not plague the Pan-African community until after colonization, and there's supposedly not a cure for something that people are immune to. I don't know. I'm just a marketing major, so I'm not an expert on it. I just want to share something that I learned in Summer Bio. Thank you for listening to my intriguing topic. And if you would like, you can follow me at Jada Simone on Instagram. That's J-A-D-A-S-A-M-O-N with two E's at the end. Thank you so much. Thank you, good sis. Thank you for bringing up this topic. Uh, Yes, there is a subset of white people who are immune to HIV. It's about 2 to 5% of people in Europe white people in Europe, who are naturally resistant to the virus. They have a gene mutation that makes it such that the white blood cells are changed a little bit, and the HIV virus cannot recognize them. So if the HIV can't recognize them, it cannot go into the white blood cells and affect it, right? Infect them. And it's funny that she mentioned the fact that it's not curable. And we always talk about how it's not curable, but there were actually two cases where people were being treated by bone marrow transplants. And the donors were the people who were immune to the HIV, right? If I remember correctly, one of them was actually within the past few months. But the person got really sick after the bone marrow transplant. But then once they got back up and running, they were cured of HIV. And now HIV cannot be detected in their blood. Isn't that crazy? That was cool. Thank you, Jada, for bringing this topic up. And if you want to submit, please do. Anytime you have one, I'll include it here on the show. So yeah, if you like this episode, if you like these new segments, reach out to me. Shout out to y'all who actually be reaching out to me. I am at the Research Her on Facebook, Twitter. I'm still learning Twitter. So you can go on there. And if you want to help me figure out Twitter, please do. I'm also on IG. You can also sign up for my research report at the Research Her. Dot com and I holla.